Alayji, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Today we're going to start off with lecture number eight for managing marketing information to gain customer insight. We're going to firstly recap what we did in the other class. We firstly talked about we firstly talked about customer insight. What is customer insight? Customer insight is the fresh marketing in information based on. Understanding. understanding the customer which helps the company in what way it helps the company create value it helps the company build relationship and it helps the company to engage with the customer so it has many benefits for the company that's why the companies are exceedingly working towards gaining more and more customer insights we talked about how companies are forming separate departments that uh, uh, that work upon gaining customer insights from different sources right we talked about how people from various parts of the organization come together in customer insight team and work towards providing quality information marketing information to the company for better decision and better informed decision making and then we talked about how customer insights uh, is important but difficult to obtain. Why was it difficult to obtain? Hmm? Because we said that needs and motives are never always lying right on top. So you question them, they, want, they would not be able to respond you directly the, about their need, their motive of purchase. You'll have to question them deeper to understand what their underlying motive was of their purchase. So to understand the customer you need to question them better and you need to you know allow them to respond to you in a fashion that you can understand their underlying motive. Then we said it's not about the amount of information but it is about the quality of information. So you, so you want better quality information and you want uh, better quality information for the fact that you need to put it for good use. Then we talked about three R's for effective uh, decision making. What were the three R's? Right information, right time and in the in the right form. Right? So the information needs to be in the right form so that it can be acted upon. Right? Then we talked about MIS. MIS refers to marketing information system which talks about the people and procedures dedicated to assessing information needs developing the needed information and helping decision makers to use the information to generate and validate actionable customer or insights. Then we talked about managing uh, marketing information and we talked about that assessing information is a two-way street, right? So the manager, the, the person who is seeking the information would tell the department, let's say customer inside department, what information he needs. The customer inside department would tell them what they can provide and you know they would find a common ground where they can find a place where you know then the need of the manager can be fulfilled and your MIS system can provide that information. So it's a, it's a two way communication. Then we talked about developing the needed information. We said that three basic sources of information. The first source was your internal database. Internal database was? Was inside the organization. Right? So on the checkout, checkout counters you generate a lot of information. You might have collected the information prior and it was in your database. So could be many reasons. Uh, there could be many ways in which you can have internal data. The second source of data was? Marketing intelligence competitive marketing intelligence whereby you look outside of the organization other than your internal database and try to find out what new opportunities there in the market and which opportunities can you capitalize on. Then the third one was marketing research. Marketing research was a more formal way of research in which you make a research plan, you implement it, you get the findings and then you use those findings to make the decisions. Then we talked about marketing research process. What was that? It was a process 
that in which initially you define the problem, you define the objectives. Once you've defined that, then you make a research plan. Once you've made the research plan, then you get the approval from the management about that research plan, whether to go about, whether to go ahead with the research plan or not. Once approved, you implement the research plan, get the findings, and then report the findings back to the management for action. Right? So this is marketing research process. Now we talked about defining the problem and research objectives in which we define, we said that three types of researches that you can undertake, right? So the first form of research is called exploratory, exploratory research. Exploratory research is a form of research which is done to explore the idea. You know, it's, it's the preliminary information gathering about a pro problem, right? So when you first time get the information, try to understand the problem that is exploratory research. Once you've understood the problem, you want to describe it even further. If you want to describe it, that would be descriptive research. Once you've described it, then you might form hypotheses and you would want to test those hypotheses. And for that, you have causal research. Then we talked about marketing, uh, developing the research plan. So we outlined a few things that are included in the research plan. The first one is you need to define the problem, what the problem is. So either your, your product is not selling, uh, you're not generating enough profit, there's something wrong, wrong with your value chain, there's this problem with your overall value delivery network. So you need to define the problem adequately for the research plan to sort of build upon that problem. Once you've done that, you need to report the objectives because you need to set scope for your research. You need to limit your research. If you don't limit your research, you would keep wandering and you would not be able to achieve the end target. So you need to set the scope. How do you set the scope of the research? By defining the objective of the research, right? Then you would want to see the information needed. So to meet those objectives, what sort of information would you need? And then after that, you would see how the results would help the management. So you need to convince the management that undertaking this particular research is a good idea and that they must allocate resources for this research. Once you've done that, we talked about the different sources, two broad categories of sources of data. So there's secondary data and there's primary data. What is secondary data? that already exists, the information that has already been generated. It, it has been there. It was collected probably for some other study um, or for some other purpose. The primary data is the data that is collected for the study that, will, that, is, that you're currently doing, right? So the data that, is, that you would col collect for your recent study would be primary data. Then we talked about the advantages and disadvantages of secondary data. So what was the advantage of secondary data? Firstly, it was lower cost. Why lower cost? Because it has already been collected. All the resources have already been used and employed in collecting the data. So you just have to get the data. That is low in cost. You can quickly obtain it since you do not have to collect the data. And the, what, would, what were the disadvantages? Since it has been collected for some other research purpose, so it might not be 100% relevant to you, right? The second one was, it might not be accurate, right? So there might be problems with the research plan, there might be problems with the analysis, there could be plenty of problems with the uh, secondary data. Then it might not be current, right? So for the data that was collected in let's say 2010, it may not be very relevant in 2018. Things have changed, dynamics have changed, businesses have changed, technology has evolved. So the data that was relevant in 2000-2010 might not be relevant in 2019. And the data might be impartial. What do we mean by impartial? It might be influenced. The data might be contaminated. Contaminated by the research that was done prior, right? 
So the researcher might have uh, so, you know, a motive to prove something, right? So he might twist and tweak the results a little bit. You know, it, it's all about number game. So he might change the numbers, he might present the results in such a way that the results might not be partial. But today's topic is primary data collection. Now primary data as we talked about is what the data that is collected for your current study, the study that you are currently yeah. undertaking. Now firstly we are going to see different research approaches or planning for the primary data collection. So there are four things that are extremely important when you are planning for collecting primary data. The first one is research approach. What research approach would you take? So whether you would want to go for observation, you would want to go for survey, you would want to go for experiment. Then talk about contact methods, you need to collect the information, right? So how would you collect the information? Whether you would go by mail, whether you would collect it personally, whether you would uh, send the you know, questionnaire online, put the questionnaire online. So there could be various methods in which, by which you could collect the primary data. And then sampling. What is sampling? Sampling? Testing. Hmm? Testing. Okay. <coughs> okay, excellent. Anybody else? What is sample? Okay. So sampling is to simply put it is the subset of the population. So it is a representative of the overall population that is there. So you cannot study the population as a whole. It's, it's not possible. Uh, it would be too time consuming. It would consume a lot of money, a lot of resources. So it's not possible. So what you do is you select people who represent the population. And then you conduct the test, you conduct the interviews, you conduct the observation, whatever method that you've selected for yourself on that very population. So it, you know, sort of limits the scope of the study. It is less costly and, you know, the results are quicker. Right? Then uh, coming down to research instruments, what sort of research instruments can you use? You can use questionnaire, the most common method, or you could use uh, mechanical instruments. We're going to study later mechanical instruments. What mechanical instruments are we talking about? Now coming down to the first element of planning for primary data. The first element was research approaches. So we're going to firstly talk about observation. So what would be observation? So you gather the primary data by observing your sample, right? So what are they doing, what actions are they taking, what sort of situation uh, is there and how they are responding to that situation. So you observe the people and you get the idea how they are going about, right? So how probably how they are using your product. For instance, there is a good case study given in your book about Huggies baby wipes, right? Now, what happened was that they, at the time they were launch, the Huggies company was launching a new product and they realized that the, the sales of their baby wipes is going down. They wanted to research why it's going down, right? Because it was a good source of income for them. So what they did was they started researching. But the usual method, for instance, questionnaire interviews, that, 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 that did not answer the question as to why the sales were going down. So they adopted another method. What they did was they gave the consumer glasses with cameras in them to see how they use the product actually. So when asked in questionnaire and during interviews how they used to use baby wipes, they said we go to the diapering, uh, we, we, you know, we change the diaper of the baby by putting them on the changing station, right? And then we put the wipes here, we change the diaper like so, you know, very formal way. What they realized during observation du with their cameras uh, was that, in fact, the people were not using the changing stations to change their babies. 
they were actually putting them on the floor, they were putting them on the bed, they were putting them, you know, on the, you know, vanity, on top of the vanity to change the baby's diapers. And it was exceedingly difficult for them to hold the baby and, you know, open the wipes and use the wipes. So they realized that it wasn't, you know, uh, the case that the customer was reporting. It is actually, uh, they're using the products in a very different setting that the customers are reporting in their questions. So by observation, they realized that there was a problem with the product, by the design of the product. So what they introduced was a product which can, you know, function by one hand. So you press on top of the baby wipes and it would open and you can use the baby wipes with one hand. So you can keep the one hand on the baby and the other hand using the wipes, right? So you don't need two hands to open the baby wipes. And that's what increased their sales. So you know, you ch they changed the packaging by observing how the people use the product in real time settings, right? So by observation, they were able to uh, increase their sales which was which was drastically going down. Um, another type of observational research is called ethnographic research. Now what happens in ethnographic research is you go to the people's natural habitat and observe them. So there would be no lab setting. You would go there, you would observe people how they uh, tend to use the product, how they interact with your brand, how they interact with your company in their natural settings. So you don't, you know, um, create an experimental, you know, environment. So what happened was, when Nokia wanted to increase its sales, it sent, it made many ethnographic teams, which comprised of anthropologists, right? So who are anthropologists? Who study human behavior. So all the people who study and um, human behavior are known as anthropologists. So in ethnographic research, they made teams of anthropologists and they sent them out to see how people used the phones. And they realized that majority of the women like to keep their mobiles in their bags and not in their hands, right? So that's an that answers why m women tend to respond to calls less, okay? You call a woman, 80% chances that she would never pick up the phone. The only reason is that the bag is uh, the, the phone is in their bags, right? So you, you do, sometimes, you know, you're in a place where you cannot hear the bell. Sometimes it's on vi vibration. You cannot feel the vibration in the bag. So there could be plenty of reasons, right? So they had to change the design accordingly. <coughs> Another thing that they realized was that in rural areas, it is, mo the mobile phone is not someone's personal property. So my mobile phone would be used by my whole family, right? So they designed a phone that was firstly inexpensive and then it was designed so that the whole house could use one single mobile phone. So it was robust, it was strong, you know, it, 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 it was supposed to be handled by different people so it needed to be strong. Then it had various phone books in it. So for instance, mother's uh, phone book is one, father's phone book is one, child's phone book is one. Right? So you could access your own phone book to see your okay. contacts. So they changed the design of the phone. They introduced that phone as a result of the ethnographic research whereby people went, anthropologists went into the natural habitat of the people and they studied how they used the phone. So that's the benefit of observational research. Now talking about survey research, survey research is whereby you would go ask people about their knowledge, about their preferences, about their buying behaviors, you would float the questionnaire and they would respond back. That is survey research. In experimental research, in experimental research, mein kya hoga? as the name indicates, what would happen in experimental research? Hmm? It would be an experimental setting whereby you would tend to control a lot of environmental factors, right? So you, you would control a lot of environmental factors and try to study the direct effect of the 
variables in question. So independent, dependent variable, how are they affecting each other? You would try to study that in experimental research by controlling all other factors. For instance, if you're introducing, uh, um, let's say there's a good example in your book about McDonald's. So let's say McDonald's introducing a new burger. What would it do? It, it, it wants to check the price, how people respond to different price levels. So they introduced a burger in let's say Lahore and in Islamabad. The, the burger would cost let's say 300 in Lahore and 350 in Islamabad. They would try to control all other aspects and then study what, which price level would generate how many sales, how, many in, uh, how much income. Right? So that is experimental research. Now talking about the contact methods, you've decided on the research approach, whether you want to go for observational research, whether do you want to go for survey research, or whether you would want to go for experimental research. By the way, that's the one point that we skipped here is which sort of research approach would be appropriate for what sort of uh, method. So for instance, in experimental research, what sort of uh, research question should be there or what sort of research approach should be there? Hmm? Which type of study should you undertake? That, that would be more appropriate. Hmm? Scientific study? Okay. You're getting there but not very close. Hmm? The cause and effect relationship, the causal research. The causal, if you, if you have a causal research, if you've div you, you, the first element of the research, define the problem and objectives. In that part, we studied three types of research. Is the, the, hmm? We just revised it. The exploratory research, the descriptive and causal. So for experimental, if you're taking the experimental research, what type of study would be most appropriate? Causal. For survey, descriptive. For observation, exploratory. Why exploratory? Because observation would tell you the preliminary information, right? Once you've got the preliminary information, you can describe it. How you can describe it? By using survey, right? Right, so initial information gathering, you can gather the initial information using uh, observations. Right, so based on those observations, you would develop questions. Right, so you've gathered the information based on those observations, you would gather the, uh, you'll make a questionnaire. Right, you've got the data, that you've described it, now you want to test the hypothesis. How would you test it? Through smoking causes cancer. That's one hypothesis. What would be the alternative of it? H naught. Smoking does not cause cancer. Now you need to prove this. Either H1 or H naught, right? So how would you do that? If H1 is not correct, that means H not, uh, H, if H1 is not correct, that means H, H naught is correct, right? So how would you do that? Through experiment. Right? So the cause and effect relationship is done through experiments. It's not a hard and fast rule, but generally this is how studies go about. No, you define the problem, the sales are going low. For instance, uh, the problem is many people are, you know, are being identified with the disease called cancer. This is the problem. What is, you know, then you would want to explore what causes cancer. So there are gazillion reasons that you find out. So probably they use microwave, that's why it's causing cancer. Uh, they're using products that are not organic, that might cause cancer. The smoking, that might cause cancer. They're using alcohol, <coughs> that might cause cancer. A gazillion reasons, right? So that would be exploratory in nature. Microwave also 
Um, ask a scientist. I don't know. Huh? Hmm? Hmm? No, I'm just giving you assumptions. What assumptions? What could exploratory research might tell you? Okay? Anybody else? Right. So we were on to exploratory research. Then taking one phenomena, we explored that smoking might cause cancer. Right? So you would try to explore more ideas about how it might cause cancer. So that would be descriptive descriptive right so you describe what agents might be there you know <coughs> caffeine hair I don't know technical terms but yeah yeah element hair that might cause cancer then you identify that the, there's let's say an ele element called ABC that you one of the elements that is causing cancer in smoking so you make a statement ABC causes cancer right so you would test these hypotheses. How would you test these hypotheses using cause and effect, causal study, right? So exploratory research is preliminary research to understand a phenomena for the very first time, right? Once you've understand the phenomena, then you want to describe it more. Once you've described it, then you would want to test it. Contact method, what sort of contact methods? are we talking about? So we're talking about mail, we're talking about telephone, we're talking about personal and then we're talking about online. Hmm? Let us see personal later. So one on one interview. I interview you, that's a personal method. You go for a focus group, that is a personal method. Right? So you send the questionnaire by mail. What could be the benefit of it? What could be the drawback of it? The first drawback of sending uh, let's say questionnaire through mail would be flexibility. flexibility so flexibility is not there what do I mean by flexibility if the respondent does not understand the question there's nobody there to explain the question to him right so it's not flexible the the researchers researcher is not there to respond to the queries of the uh, respondent Many times we have MS students, BS students coming over, handing over the questionnaires and then they go away. And uh, we are not able to understand what they are trying to ask you. Probably the scale is wrong or could be any reason. So there is nobody to, you know, to ask questions to when you are not understanding the questionnaire. So that is the first problem with the mail. However, in telephone what happens is, you're able to explain. You're on the phone, the, 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 the respondent says, I did not understand the question. Could you explain this to me? So you're able to explain. So there is more flexibility in personal level since there's one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one communication. So it is most flexible. And then online surveys are also quite flexible in a way that there's a research support system that is working along when people are filling up questionnaires, generally a research support staff. Right? Then the quantity of data that can be collected through mails, it can be a good quantity of data that can be collected through telephone, fair. Why fair? Why fair? Signals. Signals, okay. Internet connection. Internet connection. Internet connection? On the spot of both of you. Oh. It's too time consuming. Imagine a situation you need to, you know, get thousand questionnaires filled by telephone. Th calling thousand people, it's quite a job, right? So probably the quantity of the data might not be that. Um, and th th another reason is that people do not engage on phone for a very long time, right? In personal, however, the quantity of data that you can generate is huge. How can it be huge? So I start questioning somebody over here based on their answers, I would build my question. So I would ask them, why do you use iPhone? He said, I like it. Why do you like it? Because it has good features. What features are you talking about? So he would mention 10, 20 features. And on that features, I'll question him even more. So based upon his answers, I would keep on questioning. That's a technique called laddering, right? So on the basis of their answers, you build your questions. So the, the number of respondents are very few, 
yet the amount of data that you generate is huge because of the fact that you are able to build your questions based on the answers right and then online also fairly good then control of the interviewer effects now what do I mean by control of interviewer that means how biased can the results get in terms of the interviewer so if I'm interviewing okay so if I'm interviewing Zan he responds to me in a certain way I might, I might not report it the same way that he responded so there's a biasness in how I report my results right so in mail it cannot be there because the interviewer is not there so whatever is reported on the questionnaire it would reach the company and it has to be reported the same way whereas as, as at the in telephone there is still a chance that the person would you know twist and tweak the results or report the results in a wrong way in personal again there might be twist and tweak and it might not be the fact that there is a bad intention on part of the interviewer, interviewer but also the fact that interviewer might not understand you right he might not be he may, may be in a frame of mind where he would be looking at things in a different way so there would be subjectivity of understanding in terms of uh, from interviewer perspective and then online also it's fair generally when you distribute the questionnaires um, by mail or by handing over the respondent the, the 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 person collecting the information is not there that that's how people collect the data in terms of questionnaires now control of sample a control of sample is um, fair in mail excellent uh, in telephone and good in personal and excellent in online then speed of data collection speed of data collection is poor why poor because people might not mail back the questionnaire right there could be plenty of reasons why you cannot mail back the questionnaire probably there's not a you know place where you can post the letter very near to your house you might not choose to post the letter uh, by choice there might not be any incentive for you to post the letter back so there could be plenty of reasons why people might not mail back to uh, uh, your questionnaire in telephone the speed of collection is good in personal it's good and it's excellent in online because people generally tend to respond quicker through online service so if you do your a thesis it is generally advised these days to put the questionnaire online because the survey the response is much quicker and there's a facility in uh, surveys that you can encode the data then and there right so you don't have to manually enter the data so it's a good idea to use online service then service cost how does cost vary cost is um, low in mail um, high in telephone again billing is there there's a interviewer that you need to hire for interviewing the people then in personal it is poor why is it poor because you need to go to the your prospective respondent take the response and come back so that would that means employing a lot of your resources into gathering information and online again you put the data on you put the questionnaire online get the results so again very flexible very easy now one of the personal contact methods given in your book is focus group what happens in focus group is you take people from six to you take six to ten people you know you sit in a seminar hall you sit on a table and there's a moderator that would moderate the discussion so there would be one trained moderator with six to ten people interacting giving you information telling you what you ask from them right so that is a focused group discussion what is the drawback of focus group discussion the first drawback is you cannot generalize the result on overall population it's hard to generalize generalize the result what do I mean by generalization of result 
Right. So generalization means the result might not apply to the overall population. It is the opinion of 6 to 10 people that are participating in the focus group. Right. So anybody outside that 6 to 10 people, he might not agree with what focus group is talking about. So the results are not generalizable in a focus group. People not be, uh, might not want to, you know, open up, share their ideas and, you know, um, give their 100% in a focus group. They're hesitant to interact with people whom they don't know they've met for the very first time. So there might be problems with that as well. And then it's extremely expensive. As we saw earlier, personal contact methods are expensive for the very fa fact that why? Why are they expensive? Because you need to approach the respondent. He would come to you. You might have to bear the cost of him coming to you. Then you might have to entertain him. Then you need a physical facility booked where he would sit, respond to you. Then you need a moderator who is trained. If a moderator is trained, he would charge you quite an amount for moderation. Right? So it is an expensive idea. Right, so online, you can also have focus group online. What happens online is, what are the advantages of going online for a focus group? You can have low cost because you don't have to physically meet. The speed is higher, the respond rate is better, and the groups that are hard to reach, you can reach those groups through online. Now coming down to sampling, how do you... Sample. So sample, as we talked about, is a subset of <coughs> population. So there's, let's say there's, there are 1,500 students of ComSets. I need some information from them. I'll take 100 people from uh, the 1,500 people. So that 100 people would be sample of ComSets University students, right? So in sampling, what what do you have to see? The first thing that you need to see is sampling unit. So what is sampling unit? Who would you get information from? Right. So who is quiet? Who is to be studied? So whether it's the individual that is being studied, whether it's the company who is giving you the data, whether it's the household that's giving you the data. So need to define your sampling unit, whether it's an individual, whether it's a household, whether it's a family, whether it's a company. Uh, so you need to clearly define your sampling unit first. In the second part, how many people should be studied? That is the sample size. So you need to see what percent of population you would want to study, right? So 1% population, 2% population, depends on your resources, you would select the size of the population and how should the people be chosen. So what sampling method would you use is also an important part of your uh, sampling plan. So three things fall under sampling plan. Who would you take data from? That is your sampling unit. The people providing you data is sampling units. You, it might be an individual, it might be an organization, it might be family, household, right? Second element is sampling size. How many people or how many organizations or how many household would respond to your questions? And the third element is how should you choose those uh, households, individuals, businesses, right? So coming down to the third element of uh, how should the people be chosen? Now people might be, cho you might choose the people or the sample using probability sampling and non-probability sampling. What is probability sampling? What is probability sampling? Probability sampling is a sampling where every individual in the sample has an equal unknown chance of selection. Right? So that is probability sampling, okay, where there's not an equal chance of selection, right? So probability sampling is the most scientific way of choosing your sample, whereas non-probability is more easier way of choosing your sample. So when we talk about probability sampling, there's simple random sampling 
where every member of the population has an equal and known chance of selection, right? So I put the names, uh, you're sitting here, I take, a conf I take an interval and I say every fifth person would be chosen for the group, right? So one, two, three, four, five, so Zake would be selected. Then I'll go next five and then I'll choose the sixth one. So that would be simple random sampling. Everybody had an equal chance of selection. Whereas stratified sampling, what would happen in stratified sampling? You would make stratas. How would you make stratas? No, strat stratified, these are all probability sampling. So was first was simple random sampling, then we were talking about stratified sampling. Simple random sampling and non-probability sampling are one. What is stratified sampling? Stratified sampling, if you see here, in stratified sampling, you make stratas, right? So what happens is, you have brown on one, in, in one enclosure, you have blue in one enclosure, you have uh, magenta in one enclosure, red in one enclosure, orange and green in one enclosure. So if you see here, these are all mutually exclusive groups. What do I mean by mutually exclusive? They, they do not cross, right? So um, a group member that is member of let's say group A would not appear in group B. The one who is in group B would not appear in group C. So these are mutually exclusive. They would not cross their stratas. So what happens in stratas is there is homogeneity in the group. So if you see here, they are all brown. If you see in group B, they are all blue. So they are homogeneous. They are all the same. And what happens in stratified sampling is, you would, once you need to take the sample, you would take one from here, 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 depending on how much population you, or how much sample size you is, and you would create a population. Uh, a, a sample, not a population, a sample. Okay, that is stratified sampling. What would happen in cluster sampling on the other hand? If you see here, all the members are represented here. All the colors are represented here. All the colors are represented here. So you formed cluster. You have, you know, divided the population into groups and the groups are heterogeneous in nature. They are not all the same. They are heterogeneous, right? So you have brown, orange, green, blue, all the colors represented. What would happen in this? You would not choose individual from each uh, cluster, but you would choose a whole cluster because whole of the cluster has every element of the population, right? Any questions? Elements. Element sampling into one. It doesn't that become a cluster sample? Uh, hmm? It becomes a cluster sample after that, right? Because it becomes a. No, no, no. It's, a, it's, it's not cluster. You know, it's a representative of the population. But it then becomes a cluster. Huh? Uh, the word you use is not cluster, but sample, right? The cluster, the cluster is here. Once you've chosen it, it becomes a sample. Right? So it, the sample needs to be representative of the population. So if you see here, it would represent the population. What's the population? All of this is population. So it would have, it would include all the elements of the population. Yes? Take, go to the other side, cluster sampling. Would it include all the elements of the population? Yes. Because each cluster has all the elements of population. So if you've chosen the cluster, that means quiet. That means it is a representative of the population. Right? So in this case, if I choose the brown one only, that means it's not representing the whole population. It's just representing the brown circles. Right? Make sense? Any questions? Have a look at this 
this idea, you but you're not. People are not usually able to differentiate between stratified and cluster sampling. Clear? Non-probability sampling, on the other hand, is not that scientific, right? Um, it's scientific, but you know, it, it's an easier way of um, choosing sample. So, what would be non-probability sampling? In that, you have convenient sampling. So, anybody who is convenient for you to reach, you get the data from that person. On the other hand, there's judgment sampling. So, I believe, uh, I feel that you know, this student is really good. Let's get data from him. This student is very good. Let's get data from him. Based on my judgment, I have collected the data. I've made my sample. And the third one is quota sampling, where the researcher finds and interviews a prescribed number of people in each of the several categories. So you make a quota. You know, uh, I would um, get data from 10 girls and 20 boys, right? So that's quota sampling. And there's no, you know, probability. Nobody has an equal chance, equal chance of selection in non-probability sampling. Questions? So let's get to the research instrument. So what research instruments do you use? The two quiet, the two instruments that you generally use in research broadly. There's questionnaire and then there is uh, mechanical instruments. Right? So a questionnaire might be open-ended, a questionnaire might be closed-ended. So what would be an open-ended questionnaire? Okay, very good. Anybody else? Where the average respondent can express himself, right? So that's an open-ended question. You like concepts, dash. Now every respondent might have different response. You dislike concepts, dash. Every respondent might have different answer. That's an open-ended question. Whereas closed-ended is what? You like concepts, there's an option because of its fee, because of its faculty, because of its ambience. There could be plenty of options given and you can tick mark whatever you feel like. Right? So that is a close-ended question where you have to select your answer from the options that have been that has been provided to you. Right? So that is a close-ended question. Now um, it is very common, you can float the questionnaire through, uh, you can float the questionnaire in person, you can go out, distribute the questionnaire, you can dis you know, distribute the questionnaire, you can ask people by phone, you can ask people online. So very flexible in that way. One thing that you need to ensure when making a questionnaire is, it needs to be properly worded, it d should not include jargons that average respondent might not be able to use. So if I'm using the word, let's say customer equity and you know difficult words in, 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 a, in a questionnaire that an average respondent on the street might be able to not might not be able to understand that means he would not respond okay. properly. He would just mark the questions and hand over the question um, questionnaire to you. It would not make any sense at the end of the day. Right? So you want to make sure that the question is properly worded you use language according to the sample that you've selected. So let's say you, you, you're trying to question people in the rural areas and you're floating a question in, let's say, uh, you're floating the question in, let's say, English, people might not be able to respond to your questionnaire because they might not be able to read English. So a good idea would be to distribute it in Urdu or a language that they understand. Right, so it needs to be properly worded. The ordering of the questionnaire needs to be proper. Then talking about the mechanical instrument, when I say mechanical instrument, what do I mean? The checkout scanners, they provide you with um, a lot of information, right? Then people meters, neuromarketing. So people meters are what? They're usually attached to your compu uh, computers or your you know, not your computer, your televisions, and they see what content are you watching. Based upon that content, they would place the advertisements, they would tell that this is the, this is the audience, 
they are watching this types of uh, this types of contents and it would help the media houses to generate that type of content for that person and neurometers or neuromarketing employs different um, technical instruments engaging your brain activity right so you they could use MRI to see what sort of response does your brain generate when every time it looks at the brand of let's say Adidas so what sort of activity happens in your mind if you see a Lamborghini what sort of activity happens in your mind so that is neuro marketing right once you've gathered the secondary data you've gathered the um, primary data what you do is you implement the research plan okay you've got the approval from the management they've allocated the budget to you you've collected the data once you've collected the data you process the information so you 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 know sort of maybe put this data in the software get the results out and analyze the information that has been provided to you once you've analyzed the information you interpret it and then you draw conclusions out of that research and based on that conclusion you make recommendation to your uh, managers or your management right so at the end of the day it is what you report to the management that is extremely important right so this is all about marketing research questions on this no question no question give a quick look to what we've done there are two three topics in your book at the end of the chapter that is about CRM public policy ethics and marketing research I want you to go home read it yourself okay any questions with this we've come to the end of lecture 8